what were your earliest musical influences on the performing side? You know, a lot of a lot of uh, big musicians. You know, you, they they mentioned Elvis sort of gave them that that rush to start performing. Presumably, it was diff different um, artists for you. you know, uh, kind of what what got the hook in initially in terms of music? Elvis wasn't allowed in our family <laughs> back in Middlesbrough in those days. Uh, it was mega Catholic family and. The shaking of the hips and stuff was not allowed, you know. <laughs> uh, I actually, one of the things that is different about me and, and the past is I didn't start playing guitar till I was over 21. Um, it's a shame, really. I missed that complete teenage, having a local band. That all went over my head, you know. I hadn't intended to be a musician at all. But one Saturday afternoon, my mother had, she had these two mirrors at a dressing table where you could see the back of your head. And it's Saturday and you're going out, so you're checking your back of your head. And she also had an alarm clock that made tea, very kitsch, and never worked properly. It never did anything properly, including coming on in the middle of the day, not coming on when she wanted to. It came on while I was in that room. And it was a live, one, one of the very first live uh, satellite links. And it was to a, a Memphis, uh, some radio station. And they were going on about the different people around that area. And I heard this guy singing very scratched record, lots of noise. And I could hear that this weird voice that sounded like my voice. In, in other words, he couldn't sing neither, you know. <laughs> and I also heard this sound and I thought it was a violin because there was no start and stop to the note. So that night I said to the guys who were in bands, what will that have been? And that somebody told me that it was, will chop the neck of a bottle and use that on the strings. That fascinated me. And my first bottleneck was one of my sister's nail varnish bottles. And I had that for about four months, um, trying to find a bottleneck in a music shop in the north of England was very difficult and so that's what I knew it was him Charlie Patton and it was the way this voice was uh, like that and I thought it sounds like he could be me dad or me bigger brother or yeah and that, it, that was it I was gone from that day and that hooked you in absolutely and how old were my you my family were happened? really worried <laughs> um, because I wasn't, you know, if I'd have been a kid, oh, yeah, he'll get over that. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, this was uh, number one son for the ice cream company that the family was. Yeah. And he's gone nuts. He wants to play guitar, you know. They did everything to stop me from doing it, but um, no. And how old were you when you first heard Charlie Patton? I was 22. You were 22? Yeah. Yeah, because I was, you know, I was going to say, you, you know, you took, you took up... Um, music, like very late by all accounts. There's, there's been a time when I've regretted that because obviously you get into it and you wish you had that first ten year because you learn at an incredible rate with everything when you're younger. When you're younger, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I used to watch a lot of people who I became with, you know, contemporaries. Some of them, I, I almost wanted to ask them for their autographs because to me, they were something I'd only ever seen on the television. And suddenly we're all in a studio waiting to do a TV Together. somewhere in Europe. And it, it, used to, whew, it used to freak me out sometimes. But do you not think it is pretty remarkable how quickly you must have picked it up? And is it anything to do with, I mean, you, you're mentioning this is a, a seminal moment when you first heard Charlie Patton, but in those first 22 odd years, you know, d did music still affect you? Like, were you like... Yeah, it was there, you know, I had three older sisters who were buying all the new singles, Ebley Brothers, 
that kind of thing. So it was always there. You know, and was, did you did you did you notice like looking back? Did you get like quite a you know did you must have listened quite intently because to have picked it up as quickly as you obviously did. Well, the other the other thing that happened that, that really ball and chained me for a, for quite a long time was I saw it romantically. I mean, I actually at the end of a Phil Spector record. When the record faded out, because I didn't know any better, I'd sit there in Middlesbrough thinking that two men in white coats with a microphone must have gone out of the room <laughs> and shut the door. Because I didn't know about fading in, fading yeah, yeah. out, you know, I was just from Middlesbrough. Uh, and that's a kind of example as the way I used to view music romantically and not technically and it took me a long time to sort of get rid of the romanticism and learn technically how you and the practicality make a bass actually. drum up or whatever you know and did would you say that that so this moment happens and you decided to buy your first guitar mm. that was when you were 22 yes there it is wow it's hofner very thin and there was a really nice story to his second-hand shop and a sailor, this often used to happen in Middlesbrough, they drank themselves out of money over the weekend and pawned something. And that was put in as, and he was from Hamburg. And so it was like romantically, it was like that's, that's Hamburg, cool. Star Club. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. All of those, all of those links. Yeah, and where, so when you first got it, were you, did you, because, you know, I read something about you were meant to be working, um, you know, in, in the family business and you spent all your time in the store cupboard playing sly guitar. That's true, yeah. And, um, uh, so did you get, like, quite addicted to, to, to guitar and, and to practising and all of that type of stuff? Well, there was a lot of violence in the coffee bar. In, it was next to the unemployment exchange and it was over the road from where they cashed the cheque. And there was a lot of violence, a lot of drunkenness, um, and it really used to bother me. You know, I'd, I wasn't Mike Tyson, you know, so <laughs> I wasn't ready for that kind of thing. So if I'd see people coming who I knew were going to cause trouble, I'd disappear upstairs, and upstairs they kept the ice cream wafers and stuff, and there were big cardboard boxes that were very soundproof, and I built this little little building around me and the guitar and I used to sit in there and what I noticed was that when I was playing just a little simple tune on a slide guitar I would forget about where I was and so if I have you know they tell me now I had anxiety problems I didn't know that uh, I didn't know there was a name for it but um, what I did know was when I played that guitar Everything melted away. The, yeah, the depression, anxiety, it all faded away. Yeah. And how many, you know, how many hours did you sit there for a, for a time? I don't know. I wasn't counting. Uh, yeah, I guess one of my sisters that. would tell you three, four hours. You know, he's gone. And did you? And so you just fell in love with it. You know, you never did. You did you ever think, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna practice every day. I'm gonna I'm gonna get bloody good at this. No, I didn't. <laughs> you just. You just no, I have that. to be honest, and I wasn't good at practicing, you know. Um, I'm amazed at people like Mark Knopfler, who, from the age of 13, just practiced and practiced and practiced. I never did that. It was always, I used to make tunes. I didn't, I never saw the idea of copying anybody. I never used to understand the British blues thing where you go to a band, you go to a gig in Middlesbrough and see people doing covers, blues covers. And I never understood that. I used to think, why, don't, write your own thing. why don't they do their own tune, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a good attitude to have. And I, I'm still like that now. I, I don't... You want to do originals. Yeah, I don't sit here thinking I must practice this. I actually play what I want to hear. So, uh, so yeah, I mean... What I was gonna gonna and ask. my fingers aren't very good, so the, the melodies are stronger and the technique's dreadful. 
Well, it's all about melody. There's um, no point in anything unless yeah, it's, it's an accident. It looks so, yeah, so you so when you were picking up guitar, it was just by ear, and it wasn't even really that whole thing of like, oh, I'm going to listen to loads of records and copy them. Well, records were always in dodgy keys where someone had sped things up, and like the Miles Davis kind of blue, there are two copies of that. One is slower than the other one because the record company wanted one to be a bit faster, as record companies always do. Um, so you couldn't actually play at the piano anything because the piano's rigid. But with slide guitar, it didn't matter what key they were in because there's no frets, so I just play away and long, play along to it, you know. And when did you first realise that you were really good? <laughs> or do you still not think you're very good? No, I think I'm dreadful. Uh, I'm still trying to make... But when did someone first show faith? Because you mentioned... You well, what, that, what um, happened was we, there was a record coming up to Middlesbrough uh, to see, I had a band called The Beautiful Losers and they came to see us and something happened with the singer. I mean, he wasn't very happy about certain things and because I had written them, I was the only one who could actually go to the microphone. So. That's what happened. Uh, yeah, I read about that. The Losers won a, a competition, which was really convenient for me. And I got signed up by the record company. So, uh, that, was, so that was the, the start of your solo career yeah. after that? And it was all because of the voice. Nothing to do with slag guitar, nothing to do with anything. It was about his voice, which was complete. I just didn't understand that at all. And had you ever practiced I, singing before then? No, I don't like my voice at all. You don't like your voice? I don't like my voice. What, do you want to have like a falsetto or something? I'd like to have Mick Jagger's voice. Um, and I sometimes Dylan. They can mouth things uh, that don't interfere. You know, when Chris Rea goes to a microphone, you have to be really, really careful at what words you've written because you can't throw anything away. You know, like Mick Jagger will go, I'm missing you. And it's up there and there's the track. It doesn't get in the way of Keith and all that. Yeah, your voice is If big I go, I'm voice. missing, it's all over the mix, you know. Yeah, yeah. It covers the bass, covers the bass. But do you drum. not think it's like the most remarkable, like, did, like, did you, did you, like, when you first just started singing to yourself, did you not go, bloody hell, this sounds different to anything? No, Or, no. or did you just, just not think like anything it. of it? You didn't like it? No. And when they first put me with Elton John's producer... Oh, yeah, that was going to be one of my... Some, yeah. Somebody had this idea that he should sing higher. You should sing high. For America, yeah. And this was never said to me or anything. But what, did you just I get found out later, you know, but uh, that's why when I hear fool, it just makes me go well, really... Do you think you've, you've I can remember high. how hard it was to sing that high. I can feel the strain when I hear it. Do you take it down a key when you do it live? Or oh, what? absolutely. Yeah. Well, as the years go on, it's, it's gone down five semitones now. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Keeps the keyboard player busy, you know. <laughs> what keys it in this time, you know. <laughs> and and when, so when you first got paired with um, Gus Dudgeon for the Santini album, mm. um, was that something that you were excited about? Were you, you know? I didn't understand it. You see, that wasn't where I came from. You know, when I went to America for the Grammys, uh, I thought I was going to bump into Ry Cooder or Lol George or Little Feet, Randy Newman. People who inspired you, yeah. I, I was in that world and I wasn't in the, the rock god world at all. You know, I just, I'm a terrible rock star. Well. I'd like to be a better one because then I could I think, have more money. But um, I think I think the definition of being a good rock star is doing whatever you want. So uh, I think that you know it's a good thing in a way that you didn't go to the Grammys and got completely sucked in by all of that. But when you when it's you a game I don't know about, and it's a game that a lot of play. people know a lot about. Yeah. How to be cool? I think that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. But if you think you don't know about being cool, that makes you cooler. 
I don't know about that. But, <laughs> but I think you'll so have to go and ask my psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> and with the and so with that record and um, it's just gonna yeah because it's that that record and uh, Deltix Tennis first three. Um, they were all produced by Gus Dudgeon. Yeah. And, you know, do you have good, is that, is that, is that something that you just didn't feel it was the, like, the right style for you? Um, and do you, we did, didn't, did you enjoy working with him or was that we, not a good experience? We never saw eye to eye at all. Um, and we have since laughed about how, how, bad, you weren't bad, how yeah. badly paired we were, you know. Um, um, and did you like the stuff that he'd done previously or is it just not really like something that mirrors what, you, what you're after? Well, that, somehow the record company, it's funny how poison spreads and stays, you know. Some of them, because they were very frustrated with me, because I couldn't be what they wanted. You know, I didn't sit at a piano. I think Elton John, especially when he's on his own, is one of the most unbelievably good acts I've ever seen in my life. But that's not me. I don't do that. You know, he can play the, p the piano the wrong way around. You know, he's a real, real mega showman. I don't do that. It, was, it, was, never in my, it was never in my mentality to think, I, must, I can't wait to do a show where I'm sat at the piano. But, so did they, did they actually think, like, we want oh, to be a piano player? They pushed, pushed, pushed. It's very clever. I mean... Now, we are talking about a long time ago, but that's how it was in them days. There was no mass communication. There was no YouTube, internet. So people could actually manoeuvre Machiavellian ways of getting you to do something. It was all a bit more behind closed doors, all that stuff. And I, I knew guess. nothing about all of that. I hadn't been in the game, you know. I talked to lots of guys who had been playing, some of them professionally, from the age of 15. They'd forgotten more than I'll ever know. Um, I wasn't. I was this kid. I was from Middlesbrough. I didn't know much about the business at all. Didn't know how it worked. And they pushed me from pillar to post. And, like, did they not, you know, did they not kind of sit down with you and sort of, you know, because guitar's obviously what, first got you started and you could play piano as well, but did they not sort of think, realise that guitar is the sort of main thing? Or did they just not care about that and they just wanted you to do piano? They used to hate anything to do with the guitar and even more of a slide guitar. Because they just... They wanted that produced sound. It, they just didn't get it, you know. It was like, what's he doing, you know? And, d and did that pairing and that whole initial period, that, that came from you being singled out as the vocalist from the Beautiful Losers and... And somebody had told the record company from America that that voice will one day X, Y, Z. And so they didn't even kick me out. You know, they, I would like them to have kicked me out and I could go and start again, you know, but I wasn't allowed to be free at all. And when you first got discovered as a vocalist, did you then think, OK, right, uh, I'm now going to start Practicing no. singing or doing vocal warm ups or anything like that, or is it just always come just completely naturally, like you just pitch and just have that voice? I, it comes out in blues idiom. You know, lots of people have noticed that over the many, many years that it's phrasing uh, that my voice does, and it can't do like a beautiful hymn or something. You know, if, if I'm in church, someone's wedding or something. <laughs> I mean, I, I laugh my head off because I can't sing that kind of way, you know. It just goes, Wah. it just comes out. I don't like so to you, think so about you, it too so, much. So you just don't think about it and you just do it? No, I just, I'm always trying to work out how to get a blues track that'll be number one. <laughs> that's, that's my complete that's life, you know. Drive the family mental, you know, they'll, they'll say, Papa, why? You know, I'll be singing in the shower, in the kitchen, that kind of thing. And I'll go, Papa, why don't you do something like that? And I don't know what they're on about. I really don't know what they're on about. I came down here this morning 
not because you were coming, which is this is where I come every morning. And I try to write a number one blues record. Because there's something in me, long before I did anything myself, I used to love the Brill build, Building in New York and the stories of, the, of Carol King writing half a song for somebody and coming in on a different song to help out. And that kind of thing I really, really loved. My happiest life would have been if I had a job in the Brill build, Building in the late 50s, early 60s. What songwriting? Yeah, well, would fantastic. Because yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna talk about yeah, like on um, Steel River. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's that, there's that line about Motown and line about Carol King, mm. and you know, obviously the blues. It's like the big influence, and but there's a little bit of that type of soul and like, and, and as you mentioned before, melody in what you do. So is that are, are, are those, those types of music? You know, you mentioned Everly Brothers. Like I guess during those first 22 years of just listening and not playing. Do you think that, that that affected your songwriting at all? Because obviously you've been big in like the pop audience as well. Um, I, I'm personally not aware of it. Uh, after my major illness and I lost my pancreas, the, everything changed then. You know, I was literally off the planet for over two years. It was hard to come back from. I lost six and a half stone in hospital. Uh, the painkillers were dreadful, you know, heavy, heavy, because the pancreas operation is a big, big operation. And I started coming down here in my dressing gown. And John said to me, why don't you do them songs that you've always done, you know, in the coffee bar and la la la, because it's over anyway. You know, we've done well, but you're not what you used to be, and the record companies have changed. And um, so I started doing that, and I came up with the album Stony Road, thinking that it's there just to let people know what I really loved, nothing else. And it went top 10, you know. Yeah, it was a big record. It was a big record, and it was a big surprise because. There was no intention on that record to ever even get radio play. You just did it because you wanted to? And it just went mad out of Europe, yeah. And suddenly there was two Chris Reyes. There's this new one now who plays Sly Guitar. And where I've been lucky in that respect is the audience changed as well. Uh, the demograph started getting younger again because it was guys who would go to watch the slag guitar playing, and his wife or his girlfriend would go to listen to the ballads. Yeah, yeah. So I struck lucky there. Yeah. And uh, you know this. Era not that I wanted. <laughs> I would have preferred not to have had the operation, but. Um, but that was a silver. That was the pit. Yeah, that was the yeah. silver lining, without a doubt. And and setting up Jazzy Blue after, and mm. you know this this era now. Yeah. Is, 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 is do you know? Do you look back on? on like what you've done over the last 10, 15 years, like as favorably as, as anything that you've done, I guess, because you're, you're really like being, you know, true to yourself and the music that you love. It's what I do, whereas when I hear early stuff like Driving Home and Fool, uh, I actually don't even think I wrote it. I don't even think I did it. It just doesn't sound like me. But do you still, do you still, you know, do you have like big affection for those tunes or do you just, uh, well, every time the royalty statements come in, then I'm you're very, <laughs> very happy. Yes, I'm not whinging. <laughs> um, but you, do, you know, do they have a big sentimental thing for you anymore? Or? Driving does. I mean, it's like a day off from a bluesman, you know, and it literally was that. We were driving home from uh, London, and I was just bashing away little ideas, you know. I, I wasn't driving, Joan was driving because I'd been banned. Um, and we were sorting out, we had 220 quid for the whole Christmas period. And we were doing things like not much good wine or a lot more not bad wine or, and working out this 220 quid for the Christmas period. 
And God. the words sat around for years and years. It was never put out as a single. Um, and radio-wise, it's just grown and grown and grown, you know. And, and you know, do you, do you get it on at Christmas? Some of the girls put it on, because... Hey, it's a yeah, bloody good Christmas it's song. Da it's Dad's record, you know, and oh, it's they're quite proud that... It is one of the best Christmas songs, you know. Well, I don't know, that's not for me. That's not for you. You see, I had on, written... I a, think it is. Well, I had written, it shows you what I know about hit records. I'd written a Christmas song. And it was called Waiting for Your Footprints in the Snow. And it was a slow Frank Sinatra blues kind of thing. Uh, very Van Morrison-y. And that one didn't take at all. And that's my favourite Chris Rea's Christmas song, you know, but everybody else is driving home you know yeah i guess what the, the one thing about christmas songs is in most cases once you've written one huge one that's it well it's the orson you, wells story you know the, the incredible things orson wells did and yet in his obituary it was about something about the fish fingers man dies because he did an advert for fish fingers <laughs> so he's not you know, he's not remembered in the major press for Citizen Kane and stuff like that. He's ready, he's, he's that voice on the Fish Fingers advert. <laughs> and I think that happens to a lot of people. You know? Yeah, yeah. You, you, people, there's just Things a, a stick. tiny little details that stick or, or you know, moments yeah. and they don't get the whole thing, that, the whole picture. But I mean, you, you, I guess you kind of have to go in depth um, and... Uh, so, yeah, the period that I wanted to talk about is uh, the, so after Gus Dudgeon era, you know, th there's some great songs, but, you, you know, the sound, like the classic Chris Rear sounds, not, not being established in the way that you wanted it to be. And then you built, like, a really big fan base in Germany and, like, places like, you know, It started Europe. in Ireland, it started, I, I was actually in the process of looking for a, uh, I was going to have an Italian restaurant um, because I thought it was over. I'd ceased to become what you wanted to. the Elton Jewel that they all wanted me to be. So they just, they were getting disinterested completely. And I didn't have an image to so, sort of be like a union, you know, withdraw my labour and all that. I was pretty much nobody. And I went to make a record. Queen uh, gave me downtime in their studio. So I went to put these tracks down for an, an album. Uh, and the record company said, yeah, that's OK. And then what I found out... Was that water sign? Yeah. What I found out was um, that I never knew then. I was starting to wake up, though, by this time. And I had a kid, so I was getting a bit about money. Um, yeah. And I, I thought, this is too quick. They've just said yes. And then I asked somebody, and they said, what, the, what they're going to do, Chris, is they have to accept the record so they can then say, we don't take up further options. Ah, right. So they were basically it. just... It's the end. But there was one phone call went to London from Dublin. It was a guy called Dave Pennyfeather. He asked for my number. He phoned me up. He said, I've heard some of the songs of what they're talking about. It's going to be your next record. Uh, I said, well, there are only demos. He said, I want them. He said, I want them, but will you come? And this was the first time I'd ever played live since I'd been signed up. What, so you never toured in like no, the late 70s, no, no, early no. 80s? The, the record company wouldn't put money into touring. They had no intention of so that. So did you do this big tour and uh, like supporting a band called Saga? Yeah. Is that, was that, and that was, that so was, was that, that the first big tour that you did basically? Yeah, it was, yeah. And did you, how did you find that? I found it hard, to be honest. Um, you know, I'd naturally come to the end of a certain place in life you know the, I'd come to the end of my first seven years and I'd Joan had just had Josephine I didn't want to go away but I had to go away because I needed money now 
because I've got family. So it's a different thing to being young, like, and just starting off and no responsibility. Yeah, probably when so I was 15, family. 16, I would have would probably have enjoyed it. it. Yeah, but, um, so did you find that like pretty grueling then? Uh, but but you kind of felt like you had to do it to get the album out there? Yeah, I had to do it. We chased this huge band in Germany, around Germany, 64 gigs, supporting, doing the start gig for them. But did it feel very satisfying once, you know, things really started to take off from there? Because that was really the beginning. It started to take off very, very quickly. Yeah. And, and I was, was, was that a big Was that a big moment of like satisfaction for you having to have to deal with all of that? Um, you know, like kind of being put in a box and told what you wanted, you know, told by other people. Yeah. You should do this and that. It was like, it was like my first job. And it was like, was it, yeah, it must have been an amazing feeling of, you know, achievement and satisfaction given like, because it's grafting, like. Yeah, I, st I still that. have to emphasise that I'm still not very good at being a star, you know. Um, and I'm, now I'm quite thankful that I've sold what I've sold <laughs> very, very well without actually being a star. But that, you know, that's, that's, that's a position that it's very a sigh few people can do. It's a, well, so it's it's a, a big sigh of relief, I can say. <laughs> It's, a Brit you've, it's the best of both worlds because you can make the music that you love, but then it's also people want to hear it. But all I live for is this room. I mean, you know, if he pans later, this is what it's all about for me. After you've gone today, I go back we'll to back that, here. get that compressor to work, you know, all compressor and... That's good, yeah. Well, that's me very, very that. happy. And uh, when, so wh once that period had finished, like, would you, would you say, you know, Road, Road to Hell is the, best, is the best record that you've made? I wanted to make, I, by now I was with Warner Brothers um, and my first record company had sold me on to Warner's. And I said, look, I want to do, I'd become very serious. I had family and I could see the world was going wrong down here, you know, and I was missing the North. Um, and I was looking at the M25 and the M4 and I mean, the road to hell actually happened, did happen one night. We came from Heathrow, uh, it was dark, wet, very wet and windy, it was a horrible night. And I'd phoned on the first mobile phone I'd ever seen, it was the driver from Warner Brothers had a porter phone. See, I'm even calling it a porter phone because they were rare as hen's teeth and I phoned John and I said wait for me I'll only be about 20 minutes we're on the M4 four and a half hours later we were still there hadn't moved an inch we were running out of cigarettes people were getting ratty with each other in the car because somebody would take three drags instead of two and we had like three cigarettes left and he was just stuck there, you know. He couldn't open the door. Someone went out to try and have a wee. <laughs> and this blue, I always remember it was a Range Rover with blue flashing lights and a megaphone saying, stay in your car, you know. And was and that a big like, inspiration for the title track? And the when I got home, I wrote the song, yeah. Wow. Yeah, because... St I, I was literally stood still on a highway. So, yeah, because I, I was going to say about the... Um, it's an old, it's a gospel traditional tune. Yeah. Um, and it was perfect for me, you know, it was... Yeah, the vocal, I said to the vocal them, is just, you know, it's the... It's the <laughs> well, I don't classic. like it, but... Um, and and with, with, like, you know, because... They, they the said I, I, had, I had five months to put it out and I had to make the follow-up, I had to have the follow-up songs ready. Because they After said... After Road for Hell? Yeah, because they thought it was going to be a miss. What? They said, look, you crackers, blah, blah, blah. We let him have his thing, then, then and we'll do something else. Do something, yeah. And there couldn't be more. And else. I don't know why, but... I mean, that was, yeah. I couldn't stop that one selling. Is, is, that, is, that, <laughs> is that the one that you're most proud of, though? Um, because of the sales? I don't think I'm ever proud of anything. Yeah, it doesn't sound like... It sounds that like you I'm say proud of. Uh, but this goes back to the teenage thing. That's the back cover of Dancing with Strangers. It's Let's Dance. Yeah. And it's on the Morsehound label. 
Now that I'm really proud of. You know, I've actually been... To be on Motown. On Motown. Yeah. yeah. And that was so... And to hear that Berry Gordy actually liked the tune. Because uh, it's, it's like a banjo tune. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, I'm proud of that. And when that came out, was, was there going to be a thing of, you know, they said to go and tour Australia, but you didn't want to because it would have been more time away from your family? Well, it was America. It was America? Yeah. Do Amer oh, it was do America for three years or something? No, no, no. We, we, we did five months in, in Europe, and yeah. that was enough for me. Yeah, you didn't and want they to said, go. now look, we go to, now we conquer America, conquer America you know, yeah. all that. Um, and I just didn't want to leave the family. You just put your family first. And I'd, I'd done so well, I thought it's... No, this is good enough for me. Yeah, it's only greed that's going to take you on a seven-month American tour, nothing yeah. else. There are moments nowadays when I look at something and thought, yeah, I should have done that tour. <laughs> but Well, it's all worked out pretty well. And when, when you're talking about that, that um, story about Road for Hell, I was going to say about the Shamrock Diaries record, because, you know, that sort of, you know, you can see just like when you write lyrics, they're very personal. And obviously even Road to Hell, you know, that's just kind of something, something Shamrock, that happened in your life. So do you always just think... That well, Shamrock was of a certain moment. Um, I was now becoming re a little bit reticent because, you know, I was, I was paying my way. And so you then have time mentally to look at things. And we went into Dublin and I thought, Jesus, this is Middlesbrough. It's exact. Now I know why they call, they call Middlesbrough, they used to call it Little Liverpool. And Liverpool was because of Ireland. And there was the connection, you know. Churches everywhere, coal fires, terrace streets. I thought, God, this is... It's like going back to Middlesbrough in the 1950s. And did you write all the tunes? And that's where Dublin? Shamrock came from, yeah. And so did you write like Stainsby Girls? Yeah, because um, I'm now writing, at that point, I'm writing songs in looking back mode. Looking back mode, in your life. Rather than looking forward. And that tune, you know, I know it's one of your big hits, but that was sort of like one of the latest ones that I came to. I came to it last week, suddenly got it, and then I listened to it about 15 times in a row <laughs> in the car. I do, you know, when the guitar comes in and everything, it's just, it's just great. And that, rec yeah, so that, so that record, you just found yourself looking back lyrically. Yeah. And do you, uh, and do you find that you, you know, you write music and lyrics at the same, you know, it all comes out at the same time? The best ones are when it comes out. And you're just singing already you, what you You actually sing. then have to remember what you just sang. Wow. And run to a tape recorder, you know. So, you, so it's very, is it very rare that you'll sit down and you get some, you know, some chords or, you know, if you're at a piano or guitar or whatever, and then, and then you'll put words to it after? Very rare for me. Very rare. So it's like completely like an inspired thing. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty incredible. Um, so there are a couple more questions, but in a slightly different direction. So the... And um, what's pretty inspiring, I think, to people these days, because obviously, you know, the record business has pretty much collapsed. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously touring's, like, grown, but only for some people, and there are lots of people who want to be musicians. So in the 80s, you know, because after that initial Gus Dudgeon period and, and uh, troubles with record labels and stuff, by all accounts, from what I've read, you know, it could be bullshit, but you've, you, you had quite a lot of debt. And you were still making records and stuff like that, and uh, you know. But then, when you had your big success, oh, then, 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 you know, the obviously, uh, obviously uh, those, before those I started away. recording Road to Well, at that moment, I owed the record company three hundred and forty thousand pounds. And how did that did, did that feel? Was that like always in the back of your mind, throughout having to write all these songs, do all these tours, have all of that pressure, and then you had that financial pressure as well. I'd actually given up because I'd, Did you I had just a friend think you were who got, in debt forever? I had a friend from up north who got me a mortgage and he said, get a swimming pool, get a tennis court. And I'm going, I can't afford that. And he said, don't worry, you're never going to pay this mortgage off anyway, you know. Just get it, you know, and have fun. <laughs> but because we didn't know what was going to happen, we wrote to hell. We had no idea at all. So before that, I mean, there was no... The song, is, the song is nearly seven minutes long. 
So it's not like an obvious one where people are like, right, this is a pop hit. Well, 323. 3 minutes 23 seconds is the golden figure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people, some people even used to write 323 on the label, although it wasn't, just to get it past the DJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably, yeah, get people on the record to think, oh, yeah, that's probably a single. Yeah. But, but, when, but when, so you'd given up, basically. You just thought, right, yeah. I'm just going to make music and try and make as much money as possible, but I'm probably going to be in debt forever. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. So was it like, so was it a big euphoric moment when you were out of debt or were you just like, just so taken aback by the whole success that you were just... The first thing I thought of when I got told I didn't have any, I'd cleared my mortgage, I thought Caterham 7, which is a little sports car. And that's what I did. I went straight out, drove to Caterham, walked in and went, that one. And that was it. Happy as a lark. That's amazing. Um, Best car in the world. Yes. So the um, the last couple of records, like the rec uh, Road Songs for Lovers, that, mm -hmm. that, that got great reviews. It's a brilliant record. You're writing your next record. You haven't got that vibe at all about you like you, you know you talk to some musicians and they I feel like they've kind of got a bit tired and they've got a bit bored of music and you were just talking about how this this whole room's your life like that's bloody inspiring there are a few of us who in the beginning only wanted to do music and that hasn't changed and now you can see because you can see who's still doing it you know van morrison is what? Yeah, he does releases like three records a year or something yeah, nowadays. He, he loves it. He needs to do it. He he doesn't he doesn't live for music. He just does music. You, you, it's a terrible question to try and answer in an interview. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't understand. You can't explain it. What the questions are about? How do you do that every day? You know. Yeah, you just get up and do it. I think it's, I think it's great. You can do it. You know. Yeah. Uh, I always feel like I'm still getting away with it. I still have that in the back of my mind. Well. Um, and I still, we had some really good gigs on the last tour. And unfortunately, we didn't tape them. Uh, well, I've seen a couple of so things now we're, we're going to now do another tour just to make sure we tape them. When are you going to go on the road again? I reckon the back end of 19. We'll be out again. Are you going to do UK or Europe or both? Every, everywhere, yeah. The US? last two, yeah, we start in Moscow and we come home. That's, that's exactly how the two Do works. you ever do US gigs now? No, I, don't, I mean, people don't know me in America now at all. Really? There's a few people in Texas. I bet it would go down Because of the there. guitar. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's quite funny that the thing the whole business wanted to do with Chris Rea it's the one thing that hasn't happened. You know, I blew my chance with Fuller if you think it's over. I blew it. So that was a big American. I don't regret it. it. Uh, I just didn't get it. Well, I'm sure you They sent me to one of the fit. top LA radio things, and he's in town to get a grant. And this guy is, you know, how the DJs talk and everything. And he says to me, uh, so now, Chris, tell me, what's it like to be a star? <laughs> and I didn't know what he was on about. Um, I said, well, I don't know what you mean, because I don't want to be a star. And he put the record on, and he said to the record guy through the glass window, get that schmuck out of here. Really? Yeah, and everyone so in the record company was, oh my God, he's blown it, you know. They should have liked that though. At least it's someone saying something different. I know, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, if I'd have been shrewder or had enough information about how the business works, maybe I wouldn't have said that because, you know, don't piss on your own chips. Yeah, is the but old Middlesbrough I think... phrase. <laughs> it's a great phrase, that. It is a good phrase. I, th I think a lot of people who, who like your music and are fans of yours, you know, one of the big reasons is because you don't chase that. A lot of people in Europe thought I was American. What, we were always surprised. 
They just thought, you know, Chris Rea, Gus Dudgeon, la la yeah. la. Yeah, those connections. And I do like, um, you know, my songs are mainly American songs because of the blues. Yeah, uh, so it's a big it's influence. A, it's a common route, you know. Um, but I bet there, yeah, you know. But I do have a, I do have a feeling, and some guys have pointed this out to me. Commercially, I've got this dreadful thing of, I believe there's there's a chord in blues that American blues don't play. It's like it's known as a flattened fifth. Gypsies, Romanians, Italian mountains. They play this chord in sad songs. And the Americans and some of the, the journalists, they actually get a bit wobbly, like, oh, he spoke that blues song. Because he's gone, oh, la, la, la. But it's not, it's Italian heritage, you know. And is that, and it's is that a feature, that's a feature in your tune? In, in, in songs, yeah. In things like Josephine, as a, if you do the blues version of Josephine, that chord is in there. So that's what makes And they say, oh, can't you take melodic. that chord out? You know, you're spoiling the, the 12 bar thing or whatever. But that's good but to have that spoiled so it's not too trapped in, the, in sounding the same as everybody else. If I was only wanting to be commercial, I would get rid of that chord. Really? But I love that chord, yeah. Well, I think it obviously was a good decision to keep it in. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, well, we'll let you get back to the uh, to the writing and the playing and uh, doing stuff doing stuff you love. Tidying up this floor. Yeah, but yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Chris. It was it's a, a pleasure, an absolute bloody honour.